If there is something that's interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, BetterHelp Online Counseling is there for you. Get 10% off your first month by going to betterhelp.com forward slash brain and use the promo code brain during checkout to apply the discount. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to the Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello there. Welcome to the show. My name is Paul Coliani, and I'm here to help you increase your emotional intelligence so that you can avoid dysfunction, handle toxic situations with grace and ease, and show up as your authentic self. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. All right. Welcome to the show. Glad you're here. Today, I'm going to read an email uh, on something that um, it's interesting to me. It's interesting because I can relate to it. And this person who wrote says he can definitely relate to me or at least who I used to be. And so I'm just going to read through this. And it's really about insecurity on both sides of the fence here because this is a person who's married and his wife he calls a fighter. And uh, that is... I'm going to talk about that in a second, but he himself is um, insecure because his ex-wife left him and he's carried this insecurity in his relationships. I'm just going to read this because he describes it well. He says, I've been listening to your show for a while. I wanted to share something that really connected with me. I'm a a man in my mid forties who got divorced from my ex-wife under circumstances that sound similar to yours. Missed the warning signs, blindsided, just thinking everything was fine one minute and then she's rolling a suitcase out the door the next. Also, like you, I have depressive tendencies. I don't like to think of it as an illness. It's just how I am. And I know that I tend to sometimes brood on things and take them harder than most people. Although it's possible I'm just a whiner, (laughs) his words, since I have no clue what is in other people's brains. And let me just uh, say real quick, I don't think I have any more depressive tendencies. A long time ago, I used to. um, And if I said I had depressive tendencies, um... I don't feel them anymore. I, you know, there are times, or at least there have been times in the past where something will happen where I'll feel what it feels like to be depressed. I don't know how else to explain it, but I'll just be doing something mundane and then I'll have this weird emotional state change. And it, it reminds me of how it used to feel being depressed and I hate it. (laughs) I I hate that feeling. In fact, hating it has helped me stay out of it. It's not a denial. It's an awareness. It's me saying, oh, there's that depression feeling. I hate that feeling. I'm not going there again. And it gets me back on track. It helps me refocus because focus can help with depression. When you're really focused on something, you can do things to the exclusion of other things. So you can be focused on something to the exclusion of depression. That's so simplified. I know there are people out there right now that say that doesn't work and you're wrong. I I know I'm wrong, (laughs) but I'm telling you there is a component. Focus is a component and it does help with depression. And um, there's a lot to talk about on that. I've talked about depression on other episodes, but I just wanted to uh, interject this that um, he said, like you, I have depressive tendencies And so I just want to clear that up. I I don't know if I ever said that, but I have talked about that in the past. Um, Anyway, moving on. He says, I'm remarried to a wonderful woman who I met pretty soon after the divorce. She's 180 degrees different than my ex-wife, and that's mostly incredible and awesome. But she's a fighter. She's just feisty and needs to blow off steam. She probably shouldn't direct it at me, but whatever. She also left her ex-husband because he was basically a dud. Uh, I think I'm going to interject again because uh, there's some things I want to talk about as I read through this that I, I believe are important. One of the things that you just said 
it's, I don't know if it's concerning to me, but I think it, I need to take note of it. And that is, you said she probably shouldn't direct it at me, but whatever. I don't know if you're really okay with that because about whatever, you can look at it two ways. Whatever, it doesn't bother me at all. I don't think twice about it. I go to bed unfazed by it. Doesn't bother me at all. That that kind of whatever, great. If that's where you are, no problem. <laughs> but I have a feeling because of the context of your letter, your email here, that this but whatever is sort of, well, there's nothing I can do about it, so I'll just deal with it. And so this is one of those things that can really start to build up if it hasn't already really build up as resentment inside of you when you just become flippant and you minimize what you're feeling by saying, well, whatever, nothing I can do about it anyway. If you're in that space, you need to be highly aware of what's going on inside of you right now. And I would say that what's happening is building resentment or anger or fear. So if resentments are building up in you, that is going to build a foundation of negativity inside you and in the relationship. So I don't want you to gloss over stuff like that. If you have to have a but whatever moment with someone you know, I'm talking to everyone now, with anyone you know, if you just say, well, that's who he is or that's who she is, so whatever, nothing I can do about it. As long as you can go to bed okay and unfazed, I don't have a problem with it. If the whatever is a minimizer and an invalidator of your thoughts and feelings and emotions, that, that needs to be addressed inside of you. Maybe not with them, maybe with them, but it definitely needs to be addressed because it could be building inside of you and, um, creating a problem. You know, this, this is the kind of stuff that we repress and it comes out later and suddenly we're walking out the door and we're never looking back again. This can happen just like, um, this person who wrote to me, his ex-wife could have left him because this buildup continued inside of her and she never expressed it. And so it, I think it's important. You know, I talk a lot about expressing yourself and authenticity and integrity and honesty on this show. And I think it's important to remember that. I'm not saying you have to be honest about every single thing that happens in your life, but you should be honest with yourself. So you may not want to tell everyone everything you feel about them or think about them, but you should be addressing the stuff that comes up for you. So be aware of flippant statements like, well, whatever, just be aware of it. And I'm not trying to put the person down who wrote this. I'm just saying this is a, a clue for you, what I need to work on. Like I talked about, it was either last week or the week before, the unfinished business, the unresolved issues that come up for us. If we just let them go and let them fester, we end up becoming self-destructive and destroying relationships. And that's a strong word, destroying, but uh, it affects us negatively. And so it's important to remember that and try to address what's going on inside of us. So um, there's that I wanted to comment on. And there was something else, uh, depression tendencies, Although, oh, you said, although it's possible I'm, I'm just a whiner and I have no clue what's in other people's brains. Yeah, <laughs> it could be. You know what? Uh, yeah, it could be. I'm not saying you're a whiner, but it could be that you are just putting thoughts in your brain that aren't true. So yes, you're right. You have no clue what's another per in another person's brain, which is why it's so important to ask. I think one of the most important things to do is ask instead of assume. All it is is a few different letters. <laughs> All it is is taking the A-S-S-U-M-E and changing it to A-S-K and ask the person what's going on, what's on your mind, what's in your thoughts right now. Relationships tend to become damaged when the questions aren't asked and the assumptions are made. So how do we damage a relationship? We assume they don't care about us because they didn't do the dishes. Therefore, they don't respect us. Therefore, I can't love them as much as I want to. Or they don't love me as much as they say they do. And it could be all happening in our own brain. So ask, you know, uh, why didn't you do the dishes? 
they could say, oh my God, I forgot. Um, you're right. You're right. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'll go do them now. And that could be a legitimate excuse. It might not be fun to hear a hundred times, you know, but it could be a legitimate excuse. But then you think, okay, well, does that have anything to do with their love and respect for me? Well, I do feel disrespected that they don't do the dishes. You can tell them, you know, I feel disrespected when you say you're going to do something and you don't do it. And that might be a little too strong, like disrespected because they forgot to do the dishes or something. But you get the point. It's the premise that you express yourself when there's something on your mind instead of assume what's on their mind and assume that there's something going on that there may not be. And so, you know, the person who wrote, uh, I'm going to say this, you probably didn't ask too many questions because if you were like me, you just hoped inside your mind that everything was fine. Like you said, everything was fine. And then she's walking out the door. When you just assume everything is fine, then you're not talking. You're not expressing. You're not talking. You're not asking questions. I have more to say on that, but I'm going to continue reading. I'm almost done. Uh, He said, but listening to your podcast has made me realize that one of the biggest problems in our relationship comes from me being needy and fearful of being left. I've always been needy. And like you say, every woman I've ever dated has complained about it because he's saying I used to be needy. He's right. (laughs) That's just a fact. When there are five to six very different women saying the same thing about you, this is him talking, uh, there is likely some truth in there. And I realized I was actually being worse with my wife because I still had trauma left over from being left by my ex-wife. Okay. So you're saying that you were actually being worse with your current wife because you have trauma left over from being left by your ex-wife. Okay. So I'm always seeking that reassurance that things are okay with her. Ah, okay. So let me stop right there. What he's doing is he's constantly finding out if she's okay. Are you okay? Uh, Is everything all right? Uh, Did I make you angry? Uh, You know, he's asking these questions out of desperation or fear or um, preventative measures just in case something's not right. He wants to fix it as soon as possible. This is a very weakened state. This asking questions, are you okay? Are you, are you all right? Did I do something wrong? It's a very weakened, it weakens you. It is a very powerless state. It is a um, lack of confidence, a lack of security in yourself. It's a lack of strength. It's hard to really word it. But what I mean by this is that If you go around with this type of fearful energy that you might be doing something wrong or that something is wrong and you express that with these types of questions, are you okay? Is everything all right? If you're constantly doing that, then what you're doing is showing the other person all of these weakened states of being. I'm not saying that's necessarily a problem, but let's just say, I'm going to throw out a scenario here because this actually happened to me several times. Like he said, like you, I have a lot of similarities. The scenario is something very similar to my marriage. When I got married, my wife appreciated and embraced her femininity. And because of that, uh, she wanted an energy of masculinity. I I shouldn't say because of that, but uh, to complement that. She wanted someone who embraced his masculinity. So I didn't know this going in. I just was myself. I thought I was a nice guy. I, you know, being a people pleaser, I thought that would also help. And, but what ended up happening is that after two or three years of being together, I think this might have been after we were married. I'm not sure. She said, you know, I'm tired of living with a little boy. And that threw me for a loop. I had no idea what she was talking about. But I've talked about this in other shows, so I'm not going to get into too much detail, but I was pretty much like this person who wrote, are you okay? What can I do for you? Is it okay if I eat now? Is it okay if I go to bed now? I'm always asking for permission, always, always, always in that weekend space. Weekend may not be the best word here, but it is not a space of strength in myself. It's not a space of surety in myself. When you're walking around without surety in yourself, then it can come out. So here's the scenario, a man and a woman, my wife and I, for example, we're married. The woman wants to be feminine and the man wants to be masculine. 
And this works in any relationship, man, man, woman, woman, there's usually a masculine and a feminine energy. Those usually work out best. I'm not saying other things can't work out like you, you have two masculines or two feminines, but I've noticed that masculine and feminine, regardless of the gender, typically works out best because it's complementary. So here's my feminine wife getting married to what was then a childlike feminine man. And so what ends up happening is the weaknesses of the relationship start to reveal themselves in a way that you can't describe sometimes. But she started to figure it out. She started to see that I didn't have confidence in myself. I felt like I always needed to ask permission. I was always trying to give her everything she wanted and doing a terrible job at it. But I was always asking things like, are you okay? Or is everything okay? What can I do? What can I do next? And this put her in the state of mind that she can't feel comfortable being feminine because here I was not being masculine. And it's not that I was more feminine and that's why she couldn't be comfortable with it. It's just that she couldn't sense the masculinity that she needed to feel secure in the relationship. Not that you need masculinity. I'm not saying that these are all requirements, but I'm saying her specific needs were in order for her to feel feminine and be free to be herself. She needed to sense that masculinity, that strength, that conviction in my words, that belief in myself, that confidence in myself and that confidence in how I showed up in life. And that wasn't there. And so she, one day she pointed it out. She said, I'm tired of living with a little boy. And she didn't use those exact words, but she was really pointing out that I was acting like a child and I had no idea I was doing it. And that day was like a shock. <laughs> it was a shock. I was like, what, what are you talking about? I'm treating you wonderfully. I thought this was the what, what you wanted. She said, what I really want is a man. You know, she had a, a definition for that. I, I want a man. So, and she didn't say this, but you know, years later I look back and go, yeah, because she wanted to be a woman and she felt like a woman when she was with a man. <laughs> I'm emphasizing that on purpose, but I know there are people listening right now that can resonate with this. And if the person who wrote this has any sense of what I'm talking about, you probably understand this too. You probably understand where I'm going with this because when you show up as something secure to someone who may be insecure in themselves, not that feminine means insecurity, but I look at who you're married to now. You say she's a fighter. I've often found that fighters are insecure. I mean, not professional boxing, but fighters. You're like, I want to argue about this because I want to prove my point because if I don't prove my point, then where am I? Then I'm in this weakened state then I feel vulnerable and then I feel like I'm going to be attacked. So I better attack first. But why do I need to attack? Because I'm insecure. If I attack first, it appears I have strength. It appears I have power. And that often works for me. When I attack, I have power. This is her saying this. I'm putting words in her mouth. But this might be where she is. And for you to show up with this fighter, with this really strong person, and you show up as, Hey, is everything okay? Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to bother you. That really strengthens the current dynamic and your current dynamic isn't working from what you're saying. And I still haven't finished reading your email. I read it a little earlier, but I wanted to comment on this stuff. Your current dynamic is her being a fighter with someone who isn't and I'm just going to throw this out there, who isn't capable of defending himself or isn't capable of standing up to her and saying, back off. Because you might have to do that. You might have to say something like that. Not that you want to be a jerk, but you might be surprised because here's the thing. It's funny how, yes, our lives parallel. When I got with my current girlfriend and hopefully my last, um, about five or six years ago, she had the ability to yell. She has the ability to get angry. She has the ability to do a lot of things. She has a lot of dominating personality traits. And she's had these traits, I don't know, ever since she was married or even before. 
She's had these dominating personality traits that can really put a fire under her butt. And she could be, I guess you could call her a fighter too. She could absolutely fight because sometimes when you feel like you're being singled out, when you're being picked on in her life, what she went through helped her create a protective barrier around her and she had no problem lashing out and lashing back. And so, you know, I'm not describing her whole life here. I'm saying there's an aspect of her personality that is definitely, like you say, feisty. And that has come out a few times in our relationship. But now there's a difference in how it comes out. Now I don't take it personally. Now it's not a personal attack. It used to be. It used to feel very personal and it used to be, I mean, maybe it was just always my interpretation, but it always felt like a personal attack until one day I told her exactly what I just told you. I said, you need to back off right now. That's all I said. She was getting angry. She was raising her voice at me. She was pointing her finger at me. And I said, you need to back off right now. And I didn't laugh back then, but thinking about it now, it kind of is funny because we've talked about this and it's all good. But that moment was very defining for the relationship because after that, after everything settled down, she said, I am so glad you stood up to me. And I thought, what, (laughs) what does that mean? And she said, I want someone who will stand up and show me that I am crossing the line or pushing too far. I forget exactly what she said, but she wanted to know that I had it in me. Why? Why? You know, that's my thought. Well, why is that? You know, why would you want somebody to push back or stand up for himself and say, you need to back off, you know, especially when you're the one you feel like you need to prove a point or something. And it took a while to figure this out together, but we figured it out. And I really think it comes down to, we both believe this, that it comes down to Because if something were to happen while we're out and about, I know that I can trust in you to stand up for me. And that really made an impact. That made a huge impact on me because it made me realize by showing you that I can stand up to you and show you that I still love you and it hasn't affected our relationship. It's just that I have boundaries and I'm showing you those boundaries I have values and I'm showing you that you're violating some of these values by showing her that I am capable of doing that. She now has more faith and trust in me that I'll be able to do it with anyone and do it for her. Because if she knows it's in me, she knows I can pull it out. She also feels more secure in the relationship because I have this characteristic of strength that I am willing to stand up even though there might be loss involved because that can be scary. Imagine standing up for yourself with the person that you love, knowing that this person could be mad at me and leave me. It's a scary thought. But what I've learned over the years is that people need to honor their boundaries. People need to honor their values. People need to tell other people, Hey, you're crossing the line because what you end up doing is you show them your true self, your true character. And that's what I showed her that day. I showed her my true self. I said, you need to back off. And in that statement wasn't, oh, you're such a BITC. You know, I didn't call her names. I didn't say it's all her fault. I didn't say anything bad about her or against her. I protected me. In that moment, I protected me. So I stood up to her. I said, you need to back off. And that said a lot And I didn't retaliate or anything. I just said, look, you're being very disrespectful. You're pushing me here and it's not, doesn't feel good. And she understood. She got it. But that day redefined uh, everything because it showed her that I was capable of being a source of strength for her, not against her all the time, but she saw that I could do this for myself. And she deduced that I could bring this strong self into this relationship and that together it would form a stronger relationship, not just, you know, physical strength or emotional strength or mental strength, but the bonding and the intimacy that we can share because the trust builds when you are with someone who is capable of showing you their true self. 
That's another huge component of this is that when you're able to say, look, what you're doing is not right. It is disrespectful. You need to back off. You know, stop pushing me. You need to stop. When you do that, you are speaking your truth. And when you speak truth like that, you become a more trusted person. They have more trust in you because they know you'll be able to speak your truth even at the fear of loss. Even knowing that they know that by speaking up, you could potentially end the relationship. But this is how the relationship strengthens by being honest, by being truthful. And so I know I kind of went off on a tangent here, but I wanted to convey how important it is to make sure that uh, this person who wrote knows that typically the more dominant, aggressive, fighting type of person usually doesn't want to be that way. Usually they want to feel calmer inside. Like my girlfriend, she wants to feel calmer inside. She doesn't want to be aggressive. She doesn't want to lash out. Nobody likes feeling like that. As far as I know, nobody likes that. They just do it because it's part of their makeup or their survival or old trauma that they have this old trigger that keeps coming up. And so they feel like they have to lash out to protect themselves. It's not a good feeling. It's not a peaceful feeling. And so what happens is when you meet someone who isn't afraid to take that on and say, look, you need to back off or, hey, you know what? Calm down so we can talk about this. Stop yelling at me. And, you know, you just, you be upfront. Then the other person gets a truth from you. And then you're able to have a good conversation on it. I'm not saying it always works out. I'm not saying that when you say this, all this magic is going to happen and uh, things are going to change. It really depends on your situation. And, you know, I could tell you this advice and suddenly you do it and then she's walking out the door. But I look at what's working now and what's going to continue to work and what can you do to change it? And do you feel good? Do you feel happy? Because if you're not happy now, then something needs to change. She doesn't sound very happy if she has to fight with everyone. You know, I look at somebody like that who's a fighter or aggressive as someone who just wants someone to take care of her. I mean, that's how I see it. And I don't mean like she needs help. It sounds like she's a very independent woman. But I bet if somebody came along and said, hey, look, you don't have to worry about this. I'll take care of it. In fact, the person who wrote this email, if you did this for something that she doesn't look forward to, let's just say that, oh, I don't want to call my mom. She's, she says that. I don't want to call my mom. And you said, you know what? I'll call her. She might go, what? <laughs> You're going to call her? It depends on your relationship with her mom. But uh, why are you going to call her? Because I know that you don't want to talk to her, so I'll take care of it. Even though your mom is difficult to deal with. You know, I'm just making up a story here. I'm going to call her and I'll talk to her. If that had been an issue in your relationship for a while, uh, as far as her mom being harmful in some way or just mean or aggressive, and you decided to take the heat, you decided to take over, take care of it, then that will build trust in you and show her that you're actually taking care of her. Instead of asking the question, oh, are you okay? Is everything all right? What can I do next? Instead of just throwing out that type of energy, you just step in and say, I'll take care of this. I got this. You know, if she has to make that hard phone call, if she has to talk to customer service at that store and she knows she's going to get into an argument, you step in and go, you know what? I'll take care of this. Now, something like that starts to let her, let her guard down. It gives her permission to let her guard down. And if her guard is down, she's going to be a lot more peace and you're going to have a much better relationship as far as I'm concerned. When you can help someone let their guard down and tell them, you know what? I got this. No problem. That can go a long way. So this might be something that you can try. Think of the things that really bother her. Think of the things that she yells about, that she stresses about. Like I remember um, my girlfriend calling tech support for her laptop. And she was on the phone for like two hours. And they were driving her crazy. And I just looked at her and I said, look, hang up. I'll fix it. I'll take care of it. And she, you could just see the frustration and the anger building in her face because it's been so long and they kept screwing up. And so I said, look, hang up. I will take care of this. So she said, okay, fine. And she hung up and I took care of it. <laughs> really, that's, that's basically it. 
I was able to fix our computer. Actually, I didn't have to call tech support, but I was willing to do it. I was willing to get on the phone with support and do it for her. And all of that stress just washed away. I mean, she still had residual stress. She still had residual anxiety. She had residual anger from that call. But as soon as I took over and said, look, in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm going to step in here because it's too stressful for her. Because what do I want for her? We want people in our lives to be happy. We want to lower their stress level. So instead of thinking that we are the source of the stress, remove that from your mind and look at all the external factors in their life that are a source of stress. How can I make my partner, my friend, my family, this person in my life, how can I make them a little bit more comfortable? Well, I can see there's a big stress point in their life. I'm going to take care of that stress point. It's like if my mom said, every time I go to the DMV, I have to convince them of this and I have to prove that. And it just drives me crazy. I get so stressed. I'd probably say, then mom, let me go with you and let's bring all the paperwork and let me take care of that and let me talk to them. And she'd probably feel so relieved that she has some sort of support structure there. And that can, that can go a long way. Not that I need to rebuild a relationship with my mom, but you look at someone's stress points and you do your best to relieve those stress points so that they don't feel like they have to handle everything. Because that's how my girlfriend felt for the longest time. She felt like I have to do everything. I have to handle everything. I have to make all the phone calls. And she still does a good bit of that now, but she repeats over and over again how much less stress she has in her life now since we met and you know I do a lot of the housework and I was chainsawing wood outside today all the things that she would have had to have dealt with on her own I take these stresses out of her life I think that's a great way to go into any type of relationship is to see what stresses people in their life and do what we can to help not that we're imposing you know like this isn't saying oh let me take care of that for you and they don't want you to you don't want to do too much imposing on someone Because that is the, oh, what can I do for you next? Is everything okay? That is the type of energy you don't want to give. But when you see something that's a pattern, they always get mad at this. They're always upset at that. Maybe there's something you can do to change that. It could be something as simple as, oh, I can never reach the top shelf. And you go by a little step stool. And suddenly their life changes. (laughs) It could be just as simple as that. It's just something to keep in mind. And I'm going to go to break right now, but when we come back, uh, we'll read the rest and then we'll see what else we get into. We'll be right back right after this. I'm going to give you a little bit of behind the scenes to BetterHelp. BetterHelp, I've talked about it for a few weeks now. It's the website where you can connect with a professional counselor in a safe and private online environment. It's convenient and um, you can get help on your own time at your own pace. And I've had access to it and I've been using it and I've talked to a couple counselors and it's a really fascinating system. And there's two things I want to share with you about it that have really impressed me. I mean, there's a lot that impresses me about this, but one of them is their customer service has been top notch. Any issue I had, and I had a couple, but they weren't like glaring issues. In fact, I think they were my fault, but they walked me through it, helped me figure it out, got me straightened out very, very fast. I didn't have to wait and it made me feel like they cared. (laughs) I mean, I knew they cared, but this really went above and beyond. So Just the customer service alone has been a great experience. Now, that's one little tidbit. The other tidbit, which is kind of inside information, I don't even know if I'm supposed to say this, but I think it's really helpful. The two counselors that I've worked with, you know, I I wanted to ask them questions because I wanted to find out how their system worked so I can share with the listeners of the show. And when we were conversing back and forth, I noticed that after like, I don't know, what was it, 24 hours? It was a, a, a certain period of time. Uh, the counselor would reach back out to me and say, hey, how is it going? Is everything okay? You know, I haven't heard from you. Uh, Let me know what's happening. I thought that was so cool that they actually reached out to me. It wasn't like I would write a question and then get an answer 
and then I wouldn't hear back until I wrote to them. They actually wanted to keep in touch with me. How often does that happen? I mean, it's very rare. Like I worked with a dental specialist before who called me after dental surgery and I thought that was impressive. Like, wow, you're the surgeon and you're calling me like a few hours after surgery to find out if I'm okay. I think that was amazing. And so I noticed over and over again, that is the kind of treatment that you get at BetterHelp. They are just so attentive, they are conscientious, and they are caring. And if you're dealing with depression, stress, anxiety, relationship problems, sleeping problems, any old trauma, any old anger, if you have any family conflicts, if you're grieving or you have self-esteem issues, anything you want to share with them is confidential, of course, but you're going to get the help you need. You can schedule secure video sessions or phone sessions, and you can even do chatting and texting with licensed therapists. These are licensed professional counselors, and um, they specialize in all those things. And if you're not happy for any reason with the counselor that you get, you can request a new one. And again, that customer service is amazing. They walk you through it really quick. They have uh, 3,000 U.S. licensed therapists across all 50 states, but they're available all over the world. And as soon as you sign up, you can start communicating with them in under 24 hours. You're going to notice almost anything that you want to deal with, anything that you want to work on, it's available in this network of professionals. And there's even financial aid for those who qualify. So I want you to check this out. It's betterhelp.com forward slash brain and use the code word brain and you'll get 10% off your first month. If you've been thinking about doing something like this or you're looking for an alternative to the typical get in your car and drive through the snow therapy, <laughs> making it sound worse than it is, fill out the questionnaire on their site to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. It's secure, convenient, professional, and affordable. Betterhelp.com forward slash brain. Get 10% off your first month using the code word brain during checkout. Welcome back. Like I said, I'm going to read you the rest of this email and we'll see if we can um, come to some sort of resolve. So where did I leave off here? She said her, she left her ex-husband because he was basically a dud. Okay. We don't want you to be a dud. So let me finish your email here. But listening to your podcast has made me realize that one of the biggest problems to our relationship comes from me being needy and fearful of being left. All right. So he's working through some abandonment issues here or fear of abandonment issues. And so I think I read this in the last segment. I've always been needy and every woman I've dated has complained about it. That's just a fact. When there are five or six different women saying the same thing about you, there's likely some truth in there. And I'm reading this fast because I think I just read this already. And I realized I was actually being worse with my wife because I still got trauma left over from being left by my ex-wife. So I'm always seeking that reassurance that things are okay with her. I think that's where I stopped and I went off on that. Um, are you okay? Or, you know, Asking for permission all the time. And now I'm going to continue here. Add in the fact that she is a fighter. Now my ex-wife and I never argued at all. And my current wife walked out on her ex-husband. That all sort of plays together and puts me into panic mode where my brain is frantically trying to find some reassurance that things are okay, which tend to manifest as needy behavior. And so um, there's one more paragraph here, but I'm just going to comment on one of the things he said here, which was him being in trauma about being abandoned and always looking for reassurance that things are okay with her. I talked about that in the last segment, but let me tell you uh, how this can really degrade or disintegrate the connection in a relationship. If you always fear someone's going to leave you, you never enjoy the present moment. You never enjoy the time that you have with them right now. And that's not like my grand supreme advice. I'm saying that when you are constantly in fear that someone's going to leave you, you don't enjoy the present moment and you bring that fearful energy into every second that you're with them and it comes through. It shows through your behavior, through the inflection in your voice. Are you okay? You know, that kind of inflection. I'm not saying fear always sounds like that, but just little things that our subconscious mind picks up, that their subconscious mind picks up on how we show up. That's why it's important to take care of what's going on inside of you so you can bring the best version of yourself into a relationship so that what comes through 
is what is really at the core inside of you. And if you've done a lot of healing and growing and learning and and mental strength training, you are going to show up as this secure person inside yourself and you'll be able to enjoy the moment instead of worrying about the future. And this is something you have to practice. And one way I practice it, if I ever have fear about the future, is I ask myself, okay, if the world were to end tomorrow, how would I treat today? We've heard that in songs, you know. If the world were to end tomorrow, how would I treat today? If I knew I was never going to see this person that I love ever again, and this was my last moment with her, would I be focused on the fear of her leaving me? Your answer has to be no. It has to be. Because when you are focused on today and she's not packing her bags, like he said about his ex-wife, if it's not happening now, that's the moment you appreciate. That's the moment you embrace. That's the moment you take advantage of because you don't want it to end. You want to enjoy what you have now, what you have today. And I can totally relate to this. I've talked about it before, but my girlfriend asked me once, how do you possibly enjoy the relationship that you're in knowing that every person that you've ever been with has left you. And one of my answers to that was because I don't believe they're going to leave me. Even now, I don't believe she's going to leave me. I'm naive. (laughs) I'm, I don't know, I guess in a way I probably am very naive. But at the same time, I'm also more aware and more secure to ask the questions that need asking. Hey, what's going on? You haven't looked at me for the past six hours. What's happening? I'm not afraid to ask that question. It might be an answer I don't like, but I don't like being in the dark either. And this is another thing that, uh, you know, if you aren't used to expressing and being honest and finding out the truth, you'll never know what the truth is. And then one day something will happen like this, like his ex-wife leaving him, just walking out the door with her suitcase because there wasn't enough communication. But sometimes people don't communicate because they don't want to know the truth. Because if they find out the truth, oh, it's so scary. I don't, how do I deal with that? No, you got to find out the truth. You got to just dive in there and pull out what might be scary. Otherwise you're in the dark. I hate being in the dark, at least with information about the relationship. I want to know what's on her mind. I mean, if I feel something's wrong or I see that she's avoiding me or ignoring me or she's upset, I want to know. But I don't ask in a way of, are you okay? What's going on? What can I do for you? I don't ask that way. I will ask what's going on, but I'll give my subjective observation of the event. And what I mean by that is what did I witness happening instead of what am I assuming is happening? This is removing the assumptions and asking the questions. So my assumption might be, oh my God, she's mad at me. She's going to leave me. She's going to pack her bag. She's going to call her parents and say, I'm moving with you guys. All of these fears that could occupy my mind, that might occupy my mind, that I might brood on, as the person who wrote the email wrote, brooding on things. Or I could just ask the question and find out the truth. I may not get the truth. I know that too. But I'm always being honest and I'm always being honest about where I am too. If I say, hey, look, you haven't looked at me for the past six hours. What's going on? She might say nothing. And I say, well, it it feels pretty lonely here if you never look at me. So what's happening? You know, are you upset? Are you angry? But it's not the, the desperate, I hope you don't leave me vibe that I'm putting out there. It's the, hey, I'm really concerned about this because I'm in this relationship too And if you're not going to treat me like a partner and you're not going to share with me, then at least tell me what's going on because it's fair that I know. It's fair that you share with me what's happening. Now, if I know what's happening, if I know she's angry, I might give her some space, you know, if if she was angry at me. But if I don't know, if I did something I didn't even know I did, maybe I should know. (laughs) Maybe I should find out. Or if somebody else did something to her, she might need someone that she can trust in order to feel like she can let her guard down. Because when people are triggered by something, their guard is usually up. How can we let their guard down? Well, I know if I approach this as a little boy, are you okay? Is there anything I can do? Not that there's a problem with being that way, because sometimes it could call for it. There's there's some times where people are sensitive and you want to approach them a little differently. 
But when it's a constant pattern and you have what this person describes as a fighter in the relationship, then maybe the approach needs to be the opposite of the insecurity where that fighting is coming from, which is why I'm telling him and anyone listening that your inner strength can help someone else feel like they're being taken care of. Like they don't have to do all the work, like all the responsibility doesn't have to come on their shoulders. And because of that, they can let their guard down. So I've often found that the best way to help someone let their guard down is to show up as a pillar of strength in their life. So there's a lot of repetition about strength in this episode, but I am speaking specifically to the person who wrote this email and anyone else who needs this message, because if the strength isn't in you, because you haven't worked on it or you have a lot of fear and you just, you haven't been able to release that fear or process that fear, then that is something to work on. Because if somebody in your life needs that strength in order for them to feel peace and comfort, then it can be helpful for that relationship to be that strength. If you can, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that you have to do this. I'm saying that when you're in a particular situation, like the one that's described in this email, it might go a long way. It might change everything. So I'm going to read this last paragraph and see if there's anything else that um, he asks that he takes me on a different tangent or something, Uh, but we'll see where he goes with this. Uh, So he says, you helped me greatly in understanding how toxic, needy behavior is. Okay, good. I think I probably knew this at some level, but hearing you describe it brought it home in a way that I hadn't fully owned before. The other thing that you really helped me with is my fear of being abandoned is driving a lot of this behavior. And that is my issue. Great. So knowing is the first part of this challenge, right? You have to know what's going on inside of you. If it's my fear of abandonment that is causing my behavior, that is causing this neediness or this desperate uh, energy coming out of me, then I need to work on this fear of abandonment. Uh, So he goes on, uh, this is my issue. I know that. Sure, it might be nice if my wife would understand my emotional baggage and do things differently, but that's asking her to be a different person. She's a fighter. (laughs) He said that like three times in this email. She fights with me. Okay, that's four times. She fights with her mom five times. She fights with her kids. She's unlikely to change. And even if she did, I doubt it'd be permanent and I'd still have my issue. She also can't change the fact that she's the one who sought the divorce from her ex. And if she hadn't done that, I wouldn't get to be married to her anyway. Anyway, keep up the good work. Okay, so he's sharing all this stuff and he didn't necessarily have a question for me, but I'm glad he shared all of this because it really helped create a packed episode. (laughs) I mean, we talked about a lot of facets about what he is going through and a lot of what other people might be going through if they have what I might consider an unbalanced relationship. I mean, when you're in an unbalanced relationship, when there's a really strong person or really, I don't want to say aggressive, but assertive person in the relationship and the other person is kind of on the opposite spectrum, they're more like the people helper. They're the real, the giver the, I mean, not that the strong person wouldn't be a giver or not helpful, but there's, you can usually tell when one person is the more dominant one and the other person is the more submissive one. When you're in a relationship like that, if the dominant person doesn't want to be dominant, then what you're going to find is an unbalanced relationship. And I've had this happen, like I said, in the beginning of this relationship where she didn't want to be dominant. She didn't want to be responsible for everything. And she didn't want to be the lone ranger, as she put it. And so I stepped in in a lot of areas of our life together and was able to help balance the relationship. So I like to look at everything that we talked about today as a way of balancing a relationship with someone else, whether it's romantic, friend, family, doesn't matter. If you are able to find a way to balance the relationship where it's more complementary to each other, instead of one person takes care of everything or one person's always angry and they never get fulfilled and the other person's always trying to be helpful, which is great and nice and kind and all that stuff. But there might be an imbalance because the person who is more dominant may not want to be there. Just like the person who is more submissive may not want to be there. And I've often found this is true. It was true for me when I was submissive. I didn't want to be there, but I did it because I had the fear of abandonment. I had the fear that someone might leave me 
if I chose to speak my mind, if I chose to speak my truth. What I didn't know was that as soon as I started speaking my truth, as soon as I started expressing myself, as soon as I started telling the people in my life what I wanted, even though they may disagree with what I want, at least that was my assumption, if they disagree with what I want, they might not like me, so I better not say anything. That's how I used to be. But now, if they disagree with what I want, it's okay because I'm expressing what I want. And the people in my life know they'll get the truth from me. That changed everything. That changed every relationship in my life. I show up differently because I'm a different person. I don't have to worry so much that people are going to leave me because it isn't about that. It's possible they could leave me. That could happen in any relationship anytime. And because that can happen anytime, why even put it on the radar? Why bother putting it out there as a fear, knowing that it could happen anytime? So you might as well just mark it off as a given in any relationship, in any job. Anything could change at any time. Anyone could die at any time, unfortunately. Anything can happen at any time. Anyone can leave us at any time. Anyone could call us a jerk, a liar, and scum of the earth at any time. So why bother worrying about it? It's either going to happen or it's not. So that kind of thing is something that doesn't even have to be on the plate. What's on the plate is what we have in front of us today, the present moment. What's happening now? Is it happening now? If it is happening now, let's deal with it now. I love just dealing with things now, (laughs) today, in the present moment. So when something happens, uh, I can say, hey, this thing just happened. Let's talk about it. Or if it's really too hot to touch in the moment, let's talk about it in the morning. But let's not let it sit. Let's not let it fester. Let's not sweep it under the rug. Let's not say, well, whatever. That's just the way he is. We never want to leave that unfinished business unfinished. Because when we do, this is what happens. We get into relationships where the end creeps up on us because we're not being honest. We're not being expressive. We're not talking. We're not communicating. We don't want to find out the truth because the truth might be scary on and on. And then we end up sabotaging our own path to happiness because the things we wanted to work out didn't work out because we had all this faith and hope and denial that things weren't going to go bad. Yet we probably should have brought this stuff up a long time ago to talk about, to get through even at the fear that there might be a loss. When you can present yourself and be confident enough in yourself to know your boundaries, to know your values, and to speak up for yourself and say, this is what I want. And I want to share this with you if that's what you want. And I want to have a life with you if that's what you want. When you're confident about that and you can say, and when you said this, it really hurt me. That is a truth that comes out of you with the possibility that the other person may not like it, they may leave you, they may not like you, but you honor yourself and that integrity builds your character, builds who you are, strengthens you from the inside out. And when you bring that kind of strength into a relationship, you build trust, you build intimacy, and people respect you because you're being real. They don't have to interpret how you're showing up. They don't have to think, well, what's he really thinking? Because you told them. It's not like you give them every detail, but you are upfront. You tell people your truth. And um, to the person who wrote, you know, if you're still working on this fear of abandonment, like I did for many years, the best thing I did for myself was face that fear of abandonment and even bring it up saying, you know what? I'm afraid to tell you this because I think you won't like me. I always remember to prime someone like this, uh, prime myself actually, by saying something like, I'm afraid to tell you this, or I'm worried about what might happen if I say this. I'm worried about how you'll feel about me when I say this. Uh, That primes the other person to make the choice to be a bit more receptive or offended. Typically, they're more receptive. They're usually more offended if they don't care about you or care about the relationship. Um, But if they actually care about the relationship and you said, I don't want to say this because I'm afraid you'll be upset with me or something like that. What it shows them is that you're willing to walk through your fear to tell them something that might be hard to tell them or ask them something that might be hard to ask them. And if they know you're capable of doing that, 
that's going to strengthen your trust tenfold because they know you won't be too afraid to tell them the truth. That goes a long way. And being truthful with people reveals truth. I mean, really, it works both ways. When you are truthful, it reveals truths. When you're not truthful, people aren't exactly truthful around you as well. I'm not saying everyone's truthful once you are, but what I'm saying is that if there is a truth to be revealed in any relationship that you're in, by you being truthful, it forces the other person to make a choice. I shouldn't say forces, but it encourages them to make the choice. To make the choice to say, you know what, I'm glad you brought that up because I don't want to be in this relationship anymore. They may say that, but that probably won't happen unless you've been having lots and lots and lots of trouble and they've been in denial or they've been afraid to leave or whatever. What will likely happen is a truth will come out of them too. And if they want the relationship to continue or they want to see if things can work out, they're probably going to say something like, well, I'm glad you said that because I've been angry about this and I want to talk about this. And that would be a great thing because if they can get that anger out, then it's no longer festering. So we covered a lot today. Thank you so much for writing. Thanks for listening to another episode. I hope this has been helpful to you or anyone listening. Um, I appreciate you. We'll be right back. I'll say some thank yous and my goodbyes and my final words right after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to remind you of BetterHelp. Go to betterhelp.com forward slash brain and get 10% off your first month speaking to licensed counselors at your convenience on your own time and at your own pace. Betterhelp.com forward slash brain. And I want to thank those who've left reviews for the show. I am appreciative of your reviews. In fact, I just found out that there's a bunch of international reviews I haven't seen. So if you are in Australia, Portugal, the UK, Ireland, there's more Spain, I see here, Canada. If you have left reviews, I'm finally seeing some of these and I appreciate uh, so many people have left so many good reviews and I'm reading them all and it, uh, I, I tear up sometimes because these reviews are so wonderful and there's people saying that you know their lives are changing and I'm just so grateful that people write this stuff. And I am just so happy that people's lives are changing. Uh, no matter how they change, if it's a positive change, I want that for you. And I will get their negative review from time to time. It doesn't happen too often, thankfully. So uh, I think I'm on the right track. But it does happen. And I read those on the air when I get them because um, they're interesting. <laughs> Plus, I want to give you all of the information so you can make a decision. You can judge. You can discern. I want you to think critically. I I tout that on this show. You should always be thinking critically and question what you see and read and hear and validate it. Make sure it works for you. If something doesn't work for you, then it's probably not right for you. That's why when somebody writes a negative review, my show isn't right for them because they're not in a space that they need what I talk about. And that's perfectly fine. That's not a criticism about me, even though they criticize me sometimes. My self-esteem or my self-worth doesn't take a hit because it's something that they don't need. But they tuned in and they had expectations and I didn't meet those expectations. It just happens. And I think that's a good lesson in life. We aren't necessarily going to meet everyone's expectations. So they may have a judgment that seems to be about us, but really it's about their own expectations. And it's possible that we could have made them think that they're going to get something from us that they don't. But everyone has an opinion about something and that's okay. And it's just okay. You know, you have an opinion about me. That's perfectly fine. I'm okay with it. <laughs> so thank you everyone that, that writes those reviews. And thank you so much for you. If you donate to the show, if you are a patron member over at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com where you can get private episodes and the workbooks I don't sell or put online anywhere else. The people in the patron program are the monthly supporters of this show and their support is the backbone of what keeps this show going. So I am so grateful for anyone in the patron program. Thank you. And for those who donate, you can do both at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com. Thank you again. And I also thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. 
And my final thought is really about how you can show up as the best version of you. Because that really sums up a lot of what I talked about today. When you show up as you, with your thoughts, with your opinions, with your likes and dislikes, with your concerns, with your fears, with your confidence, with your strengths, when you show up as all of you, other people around you get to see who you are and especially have less to interpret. And I talked about assumptions today. We assume what's going on in somebody else's life, in their head, uh, their emotional state, the way they look at us must mean something. So we have all these assumptions. And if we don't talk about those assumptions, they stay stories in our head. They become fantastical and sometimes work against us because we have these thoughts that they might be thinking something bad about us or they might be scheming something or planning something or who knows. But when we don't show up with the confidence to just ask the question, hey, what's on your mind? Hey, I noticed that you haven't looked at me for the last six hours. What's going on? If we don't ask those types of questions, we keep the fantasy alive in our mind. And that fantasy could be a nightmare. That fantasy could be like, oh my God, they, they might leave me any moment. They're, they must hate me or they're not going to give me that raise. I know it. We have all these unfinished thoughts in our mind. So how do we finish them? We got to find out the truth. We got to reach that closure. We got to find out how to close what's open in our mind so that we don't carry this unfinished business around with us. And so I talked about unfinished business a lot in the last episode, and I talked about it in this episode as well, but I think it's worth repeating because your relationship will only go as far as you allow yourself to be yourself. And um, that kind of has an enigmatic tone to it, but if you really soak that in, the more of you that you allow to come out, the more you destroy the assumptions about you. And the more you open up the communication as well. Because if you show up as honestly being the best person you can be, being assertive when you need to be, or being submissive if you have to be, or being dominant when you have to be, there are times in different contexts where one way of being works better than the other. But when it comes from an authentic place inside of you where you're not holding back, when you really want to learn something, when you really want to say something, and you let this person part of you out, then it doesn't stay inside and it doesn't turn into insecurities and it doesn't turn into fantastical ideas about what might be happening because you actually learn what is happening. And even when you don't know what is happening, if you are able to reveal to someone else what's going on inside of you, like, hey, you know, when you do that, it makes me feel disrespected. It makes me feel like you don't value me. It makes me feel like you don't love me. When you are able to say something like that, it gives the other person the opportunity to realize, oh, that's how I'm coming across? Jeez, you know, I didn't know I was doing that. Hopefully they, they respond that way. But if they respond in any other way, like, oh, you're just being too sensitive, then you might have a problem. Or if they minimize, they invalidate, if they say things that make you look back at yourself instead of having a conversation with somebody who actually has some sort of compassion or empathy for you, if they redirect you back to you and you've already been truthful with them, then there's something else going on there. And that might be a case for an episode of Love and Abuse, <laughs> my other podcast. If you haven't heard that, Love and Abuse is my other podcast. Uh, it is for difficult relationships and emotional abuse and control and manipulation, all kinds of things over there. And um, if you feel like you can be truthful and you can be authentic, uh, but they're not being the same to you and you're not getting any closure from these conversations, it might be time to dive a little deeper into the subtle happenings of the relationship in the background. That's where the other podcast takes over. But in general, I believe it's always better to be as authentic as you can, even at the fear that you might lose something. Because what do you gain when you say nothing? All you gain is assumptions. All you gain is another day of not knowing. And those kind of gains are losses to me. They like, I just lost a whole day of not knowing. I just lost another day of thinking I know what they're thinking. I just don't like that feeling. I can't live with that feeling. And hopefully what we talked about today will be helpful to you. And if it's not helpful, then, hey, you know what? When you listen to this show, you gotta keep an open mind. <laughs> this is how you get to step into your power 
so that you can be firm in your decisions and actions. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing.